Praise the Lord, this is Dr. C. Dexter Wise III, and it is about 7 o'clock on Tuesday evening, and that means it's time for TNT, and I'm so glad to see you here for our Tuesday night teaching. Whether you are watching from across the street, across the city, across the country, across the world, we're so glad to have you joining us tonight. As a matter of fact, uh, don't forget to, to text or email or share or however you can do it. Uh, with your friends and let them know that we are on the air now. We've got a very exciting series that we are in, and the series happens to be How to Have a Happy New Year and a Happy Life. How to Have a Happy New Year and a Happy Life. I don't know about you, but uh, more than a hundred times, perhaps even a thousand times since 2020 has come in, many people have wished me a happy new year, but guess what? None of them have told me how to have one. They just said, have a happy new year. Basically, you're on your own. So what we're trying to do now is to see what the word can tell us about how to have a happy new year. We're in the book of Philippians, and Philippians only has four chapters, and we're on chapter number three. We'll say a word about that in a minute. But now that you know where we are and what we're doing, let's bow for a word of prayer before we actually get in to our lesson. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We bless you for being good, for being God, for being our guide. We thank you for bringing us into a brand new year and in many instances into a brand new era. We ask God that you would let the words of my mouth and even the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight for you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Okay, we're talking about how to have a happy new year and a happy life based on the book of Philippians. And uh, as I said, we in Philippians, Philippians only has four chapters. It's one of those power-packed little books that will bless you if you read it. And it's also one of those books that you can just sit down and read the whole book in, in one sitting. And that's always make you feel good when you say, I read a whole book of the Bible. It's only four chapters, but you did read a whole book. So what we decided to do is to look at each of these chapters in Philippians. And we found in each of these chapters one word that summarized that uh, chapter for us. And uh, all of those words began with an aura. So when it was the uh, first chapter of Philippians, the word was remember, remember. We summarized everything that happened in Philippians 1 with the word remember. And we found out that uh, we ought to remember how you made it this far. As we go into a new year, we want to be happy and we will be happy if we remember how we made it this far. How did we make it this far? The grace of God, the peace of God, somebody praying for you, and gospel fellowship. But we also, as we continue to read in that uh, first chapter of uh, Philippians, there are some other things that we should remember. And that is, remember, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, God will finish what he has begun. Whatever happens will lead to the furtherance of the gospel. This, that is to say, whatever you're going through is going to turn out in your favor. Either way, Christ will get the glory and act like a Christian no matter what. Go forward fearlessly and then take the bitter with the sweet. Whatever comes in this year, you're going to have a happy year and be able to experience it a lot better. If you just get the attitude, you're going to take the bitter with the sweet. So as we looked at the first chapter of Philippians, uh, the word that we came up with to summarize that was the word remember. And last time we went to the second chapter of Philippians, and the word that we came up with was receive, receive, receive. First remember, and now receive. Receive love, receive others, receive the mind and model of Christ, receive Christ himself, receive your maturity, receive your assignment, and finally receive those sent by God sent by God to bring a message to you like Timothy and sent with a testimony like Epaphroditus, okay? So these are the two things that we came up with already from Philippians and uh, in chapter one, remember, chapter two, receive. And tonight we're gonna have another R that we see here and that word is rejoice. In Philippians chapter three, that's the word that we're gonna look for. That's the word that we're going to focus on and see how we can, in fact, rejoice as we look at uh, the third chapter of Philippians. Okay, let's go right to the very first verse. 
And uh, we see there that we ought to rejoice in the Lord. Number one, rejoice in the Lord. He says there in uh, first verse number three, says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. In other words, it's right there in the text, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord because he is the Lord. Because he is the Lord. That's why we rejoice in him. That's enough reason right there. He hasn't blessed us. He hasn't done anything for it. Let's not even rejoice for those things, but let's rejoice because he is the Lord. And as you look at Philippians, the whole book of Philippians, uh, there are many uh, writers and many preachers and theologians and Bible scholars. If they had to pick one word to describe the whole book of Philippians, it would be this word rejoice. Because Paul uses the word rejoice in every chapter of Philippians at least once. He uses it in Philippians 1 verse 18, in Philippians 2 verse 17, and verse 18. He uses it in Philippians 3 verse 1, which is here, and then in Philippians 4 4. So it must be very important if this same word is in every chapter in this book. It's a very small book, but he made a point to say rejoice. And that's why he says there in that uh, second part of verse number three of Philippians 3, he says, For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. In other words, I don't mind repeating myself because what you need to learn how to do if you're going to have a happy new year, if you're going to have a happy life is you got to figure out how to rejoice in the Lord. But uh, this whole idea of rejoicing gets a little bit uh, more interesting because as we look at it here, we see some, some other dimension of it. And that is this. And um, that is this. <laughs> Rejoice because he is the Lord. Uh, we said that already, so I guess I was right the last time when I did it. Okay, so rejoice because he is the Lord and rejoice because he is the basis of your confidence. He is the basis of your confidence. In verse number two, it says, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, what this whole thing is about, what this line is about here is there were certain groups of people who have come to be known as Judaizers. And these are people who followed Paul around. Paul essentially preached to uh, Gentiles. And uh, he tried to preach to them that they could become Christians without doing all of the things that Jews required to be Jews. Well, of course, many of the Jews didn't like that. The Jewish Christians didn't like that. They basically said, if we got to do it, you got to do it. And so they were going around telling the uh, Gentile Christians that they had to be circumcised. They had to follow the laws that uh, traditional Jews followed in addition to being a quote unquote Christian. But Paul is trying to say to them that we have a circumcision that is the Christians, but our circumcision is not a circumcision of the flesh, but a circumcision of the heart. And we see that emphasized in Romans chapter two, verse 29. But the main thing I want you to see here is that we rejoice in the Lord because the Lord is the basis of our confidence. We are confident that we are saved. We are confident that we have a right relationship with God, not because we've been circumcised, not because we keep the Jewish law, but because the Lord is our confidence. So the first thing we ought to do is we ought to rejoice because uh, we're rejoicing in the Lord. Secondly, uh, it's okay to rejoice over your accomplishments. Now, again, these people are running around behind Paul trying to discredit him by saying that uh, he's uh, teaching people not to keep the Jewish law. And so Paul is, is kind of firing back and said, okay, so these people are following around talking about, you know, you have to do all of this, but if, if I really want to brag a little bit, if I want to pat myself on the shoulder, I really can talk about the things that I have. I mean, if you're talking about the flesh, if you're talking about confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day, which was required of male boys, of the stock of Israel. I'm a part of, of the Israel family, of the Israel nation. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. 
I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, and concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness, which is of the law, I'm blameless. So Paul is saying, if you want my resume, here it is. If you want to be able to see that uh, I got a little bit going on too, just look right here because I have done some things. I've been around the block a couple times myself. And so don't, don't, don't talk like you're the only ones who've been through this. I've been through it too. But even though I've been through this, I've got all of these things here, but that does not stop me from having Christ as my confidence. Now, I, I make a point of this because sometimes people will try to make you feel ashamed of the things that you have accomplished. They'll try to make you feel like you should hide them, that you should not um, let people know about them. Uh, you hear people say sometimes, well, education don't mean nothing. Yes, it does mean something. It means that you stayed up late at night writing papers. It means somebody paid some tuition. It means something. So you shouldn't uh, get so uppity and, and so puffed up that you think it more, means more than it does. But the fact of the matter is you ought to rejoice over the things that the Lord has allowed you to do. You ought to rejoice over the things that God has allowed you to accomplish. Don't put more emphasis on it than it deserves, but don't let people make you feel ashamed or feel bad because God has blessed you to be able to accomplish and achieve some things. And so many of us have, have kind of fallen into that category. Uh, we've, ha we've had success successful careers. We've been able to amass certain material things. We have good families. We have good jobs. We have good education. Don't, don't, don't brag about it like it's all that, but don't let anybody make you feel ashamed about it as well. So Paul says, okay, if you want to talk about the flesh, I got some stuff too. If you want to talk about accomplishments, uh, I got a little list here too. And not only do I have a list, but I'm at the top of the list. I was not just a Hebrew, but I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was not just a person who didn't like the church. I persecuted the church. I was just not just a person who obeyed the law. I was a Pharisee and I was blameless. So, so don't be bringing that stuff in here like you're the only one who, who knows anything about the law. I did all of that. And uh, while I'm not bragging about it, I just want to kind of throw it in there and let you know that uh, I got a little testimony too. Number three. So two, he's saying that uh, he rejoices over some of his accomplishments. But when we get to number three, we hear him rejoicing because of gaining Christ. Rejoicing because of gaining Christ. So it seems like thirdly, uh, in, in, in second point, he's saying, I'm rejoicing because I've done all of the, these things. But then in this third point, he's saying, I'm rejoicing because all of the things that I thought were gained I counted them as lost for Christ. As a matter of fact, I don't even consider them gain anymore, but I lost all of those things. And in fact, I've lost, suffered the loss of so many things because I get the excellence of the knowledge of Christ and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. You see that there? That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ and the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now, all of those words, they are very important and they're very important because what Paul is saying is it, it, ordinarily all of the things I just listed that I've done, that I've been, I would count those as gains. But I don't count them as gains. I count them as losses. I've given those things up. And when I gave them up, what I gained was Christ. And I gained the knowledge of Christ. And then I not only gained the knowledge of Christ, but I gained a righteousness which was not my own righteousness, but it was a righteousness which comes through faith in Christ. Righteousness which comes through faith in Christ. The Jewish law gives you a set of behavior. You follow this behavior. And according to the law, you're righteous. Okay. Well, what Paul is saying is, as a Christian, as a person who believes in Jesus Christ, we don't depend on the righteousness that comes from our behavior or keeping to the law. Our righteousness comes from Christ himself. And the only way that we know we have that righteousness is by faith. So we have the righteousness through Christ in faith or through faith in Christ and that righteousness comes from God. You get that? So, so if you if you follow 
these Judaizers, they will tell you, you got to be circumcised, you got to do this, you got to eat this, you can't eat this, you can't go this, you can't pick up this on the Sabbath, you can't do that. Paul said, you don't need to do all of that because none of that is going to give you righteousness before God because the law, once you start keeping the law, you'll never be able to keep it because there's always another law. It's too much of a burden. So what he's saying is as a Christian, our righteousness before God comes through Christ. And the only way we know we have that righteousness is by faith. And so all of the things that he could brag about, he puts them on the altar. In fact, he throws them in the trash and says that that's what that means to me. I'm willing to give up all of that because uh, I want to gain Christ. Okay. Number four. Number four says, rejoice over knowing him. Rejoice over knowing him. He says, I rejoice that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now, let's go through that very slowly because he said a whole lot of stuff in here to rejoice about. Number one, he says, I'm rejoicing that I may know him, that I may get to know him, not just hear about him, not just see a picture of him, not just read about him, but to know him. And to know Jesus Christ is something to rejoice about. But he says, I don't just want to know him in a personal way but I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to be a, able to experience that resurrection power. I want to be able to experience the salvation that comes along with that. I want to have the power that comes to the church through him having got up on the third day. And then I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Ain't a whole lot of people standing in line for that. <laughs> but he's saying, I want to be able to say that I don't just know him as my savior. I don't just know him uh, as a power broker, somebody that gives me power. But I want to be able to say that, you know, he suffered and I suffered as well. I, I'm his brother because I share that fellowship of his suffering. And as I said, a whole lot of people not standing in line to get the fellowship of his suffering because who wants to suffer? Who wants to be suffering like Jesus did? But that's a part sometimes of what it means to be his followers. So I want to have the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed to his death. And if by any means I may attain the resurrection of the dead. So what he's saying is that if I should suffer, if I end up dying as a result of that, I also want to know what it's like to be raised from the dead as Jesus was and uh, as we are promised to do when he comes back again. So we rejoice over knowing him. We rejoice over the power that comes along with knowing him. We rejoice over the privilege of being able to suffer with him. And we rejoice over the fact that even when we pass away, that at some point we will rise from the dead even as he rose. And that's something to rejoice about. Okay, so first of all, we rejoice in the Lord. Then we rejoice over our accomplishments. Then we rejoice because of gaining Christ. Then we rejoice because we know him. Praise the Lord. Just because we know him, that's worth rejoicing there. And then number five, we rejoice that we have been called for a reason. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. I have been called for a reason. I rejoice because I am not just a Christian because Jesus was trying to make up a number. I'm not just a Christian because I just happen to be in the church on a particular Sunday. I'm a Christian because I have been called for a specific reason. And Paul says, I know that I haven't attained and I know that I'm not perfect but I'm pressing on because I want to grab a hold of that for which Christ grabbed a hold of me. I, oh, I love this verse. I love this verse because what he is saying is that, 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 that I'm reaching to grab that 
which Jesus reached to grab in me. I was grabbed for a reason. I was apprehended for a reason. And I'm trying to apprehend the reason that I was apprehended. And I'm pressing toward that and I'm rejoicing that I was called for a reason. And sometimes you may not know that reason. You may not know it yet. You may not have a sense of exactly what it is, but you know that you're just not out here for nothing. You're not just out here doing things, you know, willy nilly. But God has called you for a reason. He's put tools in you. He's put gifts in you. He's actually given you a life experience that prepares you for the thing that he has called you for. Some of the things that you just dread that happened to you qualifies you for the next phase in your ministry. Some of the things that you shed all kinds of crocodile tears because they happened to you. Now you are able to minister to other people who will go through the same things that you have already been through. And so the fact of the matter is that you have been called for a reason. You have been called for a purpose. You have been called for a specific time. You have been called for a specific season. You have been called for a specific group of people, a specific geography. And all of these things is, are not accidental. They are providential. And Paul says that I am trying to grab a hold of that thing or that reason or that purpose for which Christ grabbed a hold of me. I'm trying to apprehend that for which I have been apprehended. And that makes me rejoice to know that there's there's a plan in my life. There's a there's a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. There's an even reason why things happen the way that they happen. And sometimes it's so it's so hard to, to realize and even to believe that uh, things do happen the way they happen. But we do know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So we rejoice that we have been called for a reason. And then number six, we rejoice that we can forget what is behind. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. That, my brothers and sisters, is a whole lot easier said than done. That's a whole lot to forget those things which are behind. How are we going to forget those things which are behind? How are we going to forget some of those hurts? How are we going to forget some of that pain? How are we going to forget some of those disappointments? How are we going to forget that? Well, one way to forget it is to realize that when Paul says forget, he doesn't mean to take it out of your mind. He means to let loose of them. It means to take the effect of those things off of you, sort of like to take off a coat. You know, um, I have this coat on, but I'm going to take this coat off and I'm going to continue in my life without the coat. And forgetting those things is more like forsaking those things than failing to remember those things. And that's why it's hard for so many of us to, to, to read this verse and to try to keep it is because we try to do something that's impossible. How are you going to forget? I mean, things have happened to you, you don't forget. You got the scar right here, and every time you look at the scar, you remember the incident that made that happen. You're not required to block it out of your memory. If you can do that, wonderful. But what this verse is saying, that I'm rejoicing that I can forsake those things which are behind. I'm not going to feed them. I'm not going to give them more energy. I'm not going to give them power over my life that they don't deserve. I'm not going to look backwards towards them. I'm not going to uh, not be able to go forward because I'm so busy looking backwards. I'm going to forsake them. And they're going to die from a lack of attention. Now, those things that are behind us, obviously, they brought us to this place. But many of those things that are behind us, they will keep us back there if we don't forsake them, if we don't leave them, if we don't disregard them, if we don't go forward in spite of them. So Paul is saying, I am rejoicing because, praise God, I've gotten to the place where I can forsake those things which are behind me. I can forsake them. And, and uh, you can probably think of some things in your life that you should uh, pretty much be forsaking. Uh, and the more that you are able to forsake those things and leave those things, 
and uh, get those things uh, from having power over your life, the more you'll be able to be happy, not only in the new year, but the rest of your life. All of us have a little list of things that we need to forsake. And it is a conscious decision. It's a conscious decision because if you allow them, they'll follow you around. And not only follow you around, they'll have all kinds of signs and posters and they'll have little groupies and things reminding you of what you used to be, where you used to do, what you used to do and all of that. But you've got to forsake those things. You've got to make up in your mind that I'm putting all of those things behind me and I'm going forward in Jesus' name. That was number six. And this is number seven. Rejoice for the things that are ahead. Rejoice for the things that are ahead. So I'm forgetting those things which are behind. I'm forsaking those things which are behind. And I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I'm pressing toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Reaching forward to those things which are ahead. It's going to be hard for you to move ahead if you haven't forsaken those things which are behind you. And yet it's going to make you excited to go ahead if you have a sense that there are good things ahead. It's difficult for you to wake up in the morning and get moving if you don't have a sense that there's good stuff going to happen today. If you don't have a sense that your life is going in a direction and that uh, the best is yet to come. And what Paul is saying is, yeah, I got some stuff behind me. I've forsaken that, but I'm pressing forward because I believe that there's some things that are ahead that are worth me going towards. There's a prize ahead. There's a high calling ahead. There are blessings ahead that I can't even imagine. And so I'm on my way into tomorrow because I believe that tomorrow has beautiful things that are ahead. And so if we have a sense uh, as we come into the new year of depression and doldrums, and this is going to be worse than the one we had before, then who wants to go? I mean, who wants to get up in the morning? Who wants to start working? Who wants to work on ministry? Who wants to do? Nobody. But if you forsake those things which are behind, those things which have hindered you, those things which have blocked you, those things which have discouraged you, you forsake those things and you know what? I'm pressing forward because I have a sense that there's something that is ahead. And the things that are ahead are the promises of God. The things that are ahead are the things that God said he's going to do and he ain't done yet. The things that are ahead are the things that are in your heart that God placed them in your heart. Not just things that you desire, but God placed them in your heart. And because he placed them in your heart, it's his responsibility to make those things happen. And that's what you should look forward to. And as you look forward to, that's something to rejoice about. I'm rejoicing about the things that have not yet come into fruition that God promised. And I believe I'm going to see them. So I just can't wait to see what God is going to do because I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I am rejoicing for what lies ahead. Don't be worried about the future. I mean, there's so many things as you look around today, and, and not just in the news, but in your own life, that uh, don't seem to be trending in the positive direction. But trust me, we serve a God that will make things work. We serve a God that will turn things around. We serve a God that, as we said on last week, will make things turn out in your favor. And so even though you may have to go through, just know that when you go through on the other side, it's going to be something that you ought to be willing and rejoicing about moving toward because it's going to be good. OK, so so Paul says in this seventh instance that, that we're pointing out here is that he rejoiced for the things that are ahead. Rejoice for the things that are ahead. Number eight. Rejoice that you are a citizen of heaven. All of these verses here, 17, all the way down to 20, he talks about people who are around the Philippians who do not follow his example. These people around the Philippians, well, the Philippians follow his example, but the ones around him, he says, uh, they are, they're weeping and they are enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is in their shame. In other words, they glory in shameful things, and their mind are on earthly things. But he says about us, for our citizenship is in heaven, 
from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to say that your citizenship is in heaven? It means that even though you are on earth, that where you belong and where you are from is from heaven. Okay, so you'll understand this. You have a passport, and let's say you are in another country. Let's say you're in France. So you're in France, but you have an American passport. Well, you live in a, you're, you're presently in a foreign country, but the passport indicates where you are from. So it doesn't matter where you are, that does not change where you are from. And what Paul is saying is we are in a land surrounded by people who are foreigners to God. But it's okay because we come from heaven. Our citizenship, our, our, our identification, our, our record is in heaven. And because our record is in heaven, we rejoice that we are not bound by the things that are here on earth. That's a major, major thing to realize. Uh, I, I've seen so many times that I've been in places outside of the country and the conditions of the places that I was in outside of the country was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm glad I don't live here. But the only reason that I was able to survive and uh, kind of keep myself halfway going in those places is I knew that I had a home. And the home that I had was in another country. And the home that I had in another country was a place where I was going to go eventually. Being in that condition in that country was a temporary thing. But at some point, I was gonna be able to leave that and go back to the place where I came from and where I belong. And so one of the things that we need to do and is helpful for us to do is to realize that even though we are here, even though we're in this culture, even though we're in this environment, that ought not to be our frame of reference. Our frame of reference ought to be heaven. Our frame of reference ought to be godly. Our frame of reference ought to be the laws of Jesus Christ, the word, and so forth. And so now we don't judge ourselves. We don't uh, determine who we are based on where we are. We determine who we are based on where we came from, where home is. And according to Paul, that is heaven. We are citizens of heaven. That's where our citizenship is. It's in heaven. And because of that, you ought to rejoice. And then number nine, rejoice that this is not the end. This is not the end. Verse 21 says that he will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, what does that mean? That means that in the end, Jesus will transform your body until it becomes conformed to his glorious body. In other words, when uh, that great getting up morning happens, he will take our bodies and they will become like his glorious body. Don't ask me what that is. Don't ask me what the glorious body of Jesus is. I have no idea. And if anybody tells you they, they know, they don't know either. But we do know one thing, that uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And so the thing that he is saying that we ought to rejoice about finally in this third chapter is rejoice that this is not the end. This body that we're in is not the end. This life that we live is not the end. These troubles that we're having, it's not the end. But in the end, when the end comes, when he shall appear, he will take our bodies, he will take our burdens, he'll take our difficulties and transform all of that to conform into his glorious body. In other words, we shall be like him. And I don't know about you, but that's something that we ought to rejoice about. Let me give you that list again and see if that'll help you. Then we'll have a word of prayer and we'll go from here. Here's the list of things that I have drawn out of the third chapter of Philippians that we ought to rejoice about. Number one, rejoice in the Lord. Number two, rejoice over your accomplishments. Number three, rejoice because of gaining Christ. Number four, rejoice over knowing him. Number five, rejoice that you have been called for a reason. Number six, rejoice that you can forget what is behind, forsake it. 
Number seven, rejoice for the things that are ahead. Praise God, some good stuff is ahead. Number eight, rejoice that you are a citizen of heaven. That's where you come from and that's where you're going back to. And number nine, rejoice that this is not the end. This body, this world, none of that is the end. Let me say one last thing about rejoice. There's a difference between be happy and rejoice. There's a difference between be happy and rejoice. You can be completely happy and nobody knows it but you. But when you rejoice, everybody knows it. And what Paul is saying is, I don't just want you to be happy. I want you to be so happy that you rejoice, that you open your mouth, that you express it in some way to let other people know that for all of these reasons and more that we have just outlined, we are rejoicing in the Lord. We are rejoicing because we are children of God. We're rejoicing because we've been saved and so on and so forth. So, so, so it's not enough just to be happy. It's not enough to just have this little burning on the inside. Oh, I feel wonderful. But he said, I want you to rejoice. I want you to make some noise. I want you to show some signs. I want you to act like you're happy. Don't just be happy. Act like you're happy. Look like you're happy. Sound like you're happy. Rejoice. And that rejoicing begins with me as an individual, begins with you as an individual. Then it begins with us as a body of Christ. So, so make a joyful noise unto the Lord. The psalm says, make the noise. It's not going to happen, but you got to make the noise. And that's what we're trying to say. And that's what Paul is saying, that if you want to have a happy new year and a happy life, you just can't be happy. You got to rejoice. And somehow or another, as we rejoice, as we give God the praise, as we bless his name, that whole process of rejoicing will bring joy to us and bring joy to our life. So the word for Philippians chapter one is remember. The word for Philippians chapter two is receive. And the word for Philippians chapter three is rejoice. So we invite you to come back next Tuesday uh, at seven o'clock for TNT, where we'll close it out with the fourth word. And that fourth word, uh, not surprisingly, will also begin with an R and uh, we're going to be blessed in that way. Let me have a word of prayer. And then we're going to go. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. And we bless you. We thank you for all the people who are watching and listening tonight, whether they're doing it live or by playback in some form. We ask God that you might get us to the place where we actually can rejoice. There's so many problems and issues in our life. There's so many hurts that yet need to be healed. There's so many needs that need to be met. But in it all, through it all, and in spite of it all, help us to listen to Paul and say, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Okay, that's it for tonight. Don't, uh, don't forget, this coming Sunday is the first Sunday in February, which means it's Communion Sunday. And uh, that's the Sunday we don't want you to miss. If you are one of the people who watch us, particularly on the internet, and don't physically come to worship, this is the one Sunday I want to see you at Faith Ministries Church. If you want to uh, come, make sure you come this Sunday so that you can have communion and fellowship with us as one body in Christ. All right, 2747 Agri Road, Columbus, Ohio, 43224, Faith Ministries church faith ministries dot church you can get more information god bless you and uh, we'll see you this sunday at faith ministries for church